there friends and thanks again for joining us here on expanded perspectives that's right i am cam hale and as always the man that needs no introduction but has to stay 200 feet away from a school mr kyle filson how's it going everybody i'm excited to be here today it's interesting uh, i was watching some interesting fights last night i got really geeked up <laughs> i needed to talk to cam about mr damian maya yeah and uh, that's all I'm we've here. been doing. We've been in studio now for quite some time, and we've just been discussing MMA like crazy. Yeah. It would have been made its own show, the way we've been giddy like school children. The fight was amazing. Everything was great. Hope everybody is having a wonderful uh, start of the week. Uh, weather's good. Everybody's doing good. Everything's doing great. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to get into some really interesting story today that's going to involve some wolves. But I wanted to run this by you, Philly. Sure. I've always thought it was weird. And I'm sure everybody else does. It's not just the U.S., but around the world, the wolf fascination. And I always think back that one of the very first wolf movies I remember seeing is like, uh, what is it, White Fang. Yeah. Remember, remember that, that old as movie? A, yeah. As a kid, right? I think we read it in first in school, and then they let us watch yeah, it then they let, after we read yes, it. Yes, yeah. exactly. But you think about it. It's, this is one of those, you know, we talk about the dog man. And we talk about werewolves and we talk about these, you know, the, the, the monsters on the moors, you know, and all these hellhounds and these things. But you don't realize just it's how almost integrated they are with us. You know, it's something. It's a it's a big deal. It's something that's really. Well, there's, there's like the saying, the wolf wolves at your door. Yeah, I mean that's exa- a thing. That's, that's a- exactly. There's a lot of stuff that goes along with that, and I think it's interesting. I really do get drawn into the fact. I'm like, wow. And of course, if you love a movie with wolf in the title, you're gonna have to go with Dance with Wolves. Come on. I mean, of course, that's really a coyote. You know, I don't think that's meant to be a wolf, is it? I mean, it seems yeah. more like a coyote. It's still a good movie, though. It's still a great movie, a great movie. So we're going to get into some stuff along that with some hellhounds. Before we jump into that, look, you've been staying out of trouble? I've been doing a good job, trying. The bro had been doing good in school. They're having fun so far? Yeah, yeah they're back in the full swing of things, and it, it seems like, whether they want to admit it or not, I think they kind of like going. Yeah, they're not going to say that. No. They're not going to say that at all. Well, my daughter had a great little surprise party we had for her for the family Friday. Uh, she got her vehicle that she's driving. It's hard for me to let her go on that whole thing. She's out running around. Today will be the first day she drove herself to school. That is a bit much for a dad to take. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not. That's cool, though. I didn't shed, shed any tears, but it was close. I'm like, man, I can't believe I got to let her go now. This is BS. But, eh, it is what it is, folks. Uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to be talking about the wolf or wolves if you will of mon at the battle of mon for those of you that hadn't heard it this is going to be something new i'm sure most of you have probably heard bits and pieces of it but we're not just going to speak on that i'm going to get into the in-depth into some history we're going to go back we're going to start out a little bit at the beginning if you will of the human interaction with these animals and kind of what it's led up to it's going to be an interesting little tale to follow and we'll see how you enjoy it. So right on the other side of this little quick break, we're going to get back with a very interesting story with the Wolves of Mon.
wolf. The word alone can bring many different images to the mind's eye. Some picture a massive, snarling beast bringing down an elk or a caribou in a nature documentary, while others see the loving nature in which all the pack looks out for each other. And still others see the lustful and comical cartoon image of a wolf that was meant to portray men calling to women. No matter what you picture, one that we all have in common is that somewhere in our soul or ingrained in our DNA is a feeling of kinship, some strange bond or connection that we can't quite put our fingers on. Perhaps it is what drives our love with our best friend, the dog. Reports in canine history, like many historical studies, have changed over the years, one of which being what we now understand to be the origins of the modern dog and when it happened. We once believed that our special friendship with these four-legged family members started around the time we shifted from hunter-gatherers to a farming lifestyle. From there, being in one place allowed these animals to approach us and find food and shelter for themselves. But in an article published in 2015 on LiveScience.com, researchers found a surprising link. Genetic evidence from an ancient wolf bone discovered lying on the tundra in Siberia's Taimir Peninsula reveals that wolves and dogs split from their common ancestor at least 27,000 years ago. One of the researchers and lead study author, Pontus Skoglund, who studies ancient DNA at Harvard Medical School and the Broad Institute, had this to say about the discovery. Although separation isn't the same as domestication, this opens up the possibility that domestication occurred much earlier than we thought before. Siberian Huskies have a portion of their genome that traces back exclusively to this ancient Siberian wolf. It's pretty amazing that there is a special genetic connection to a wolf that roamed the tundra 35,000 years ago. So there it is. We did have our best friend while we roamed the plains and mountains as hunter-gatherers. By our side for thousands of years, these creatures evolved into family members, some more trustworthy than our actual family. The folklore that supports this fascination goes back deep into our history as well all the way back to the Babylonian epic, Gilgamesh. There, the goddess Ishtar is reminded that she turned an old lover into a wolf because that man had been a sheep herder and he had hated wolves. Stories like this continue through time and other cultures also. My favorite story being the Norse tale of three wolves, in particular the giant Fenrir. Fenrir is bound by the gods, but is ultimately destined to grow too large for his bonds and devour Odin during the course of Ragnarok. At that time, he will have grown so large that his upper jaw touches the sky, while his lower touches the earth when he opens. It is said he will be slain by Odin's son, Vyar, who will either stab him in the heart or rip his jaws out according to different accounts. And Fenrir's two offspring will, according to the legend, devour the moon and the sun at Ragnarok. It is also found in Native American mythology that many of the tribes have what is called wolf clans, including the Cree, the Cherokee, Chippewa, Algonquin tribes like the Shawnee, the Huron and Iroquois, even Plains tribes like Osage and Caddo, the Southern tribes like the Chickasaw and the Pueblos of New Mexico. The wolf was an important clan crest on the Northwest coast and can even also be found carved on totem poles. The wolf is also a very special tribal symbol to several tribes and bands, such as the Munsee in Delaware, the Mohegans, some Eastern tribes, 
like the Shawnee, have a wolf dance among their tribal dance traditions. But it doesn't end there, though. It seems the island of Japan has its own wolf fascination. With its tales of the Okami, commonly called the Japanese wolf, it became extinct in 1905, even though there have been many sightings around a certain Kinji Peninsula. The father of Japanese folklore studies, Yanagita Kunjo, said that the wolf can hide even where there is only a single reed. And in Japan, if one kills a wolf for any reason, that person and his family have reason to fear divine retribution. And in certain villages, it's even a custom to make an offering of rice whenever a wolf cub is born. And wolves are sometimes known to make return offerings of meat when a village woman gives birth. They're said to leave certain kills as gifts for the village. Though if the villagers do not leave it a portion of meat as a gift in return, says the wolf would grow angry. The reason the wolf was so highly regarded is that it was a protector of the rice fields against the deer, the hare, and the wild hogs. We even have children's tales, like Little Red Riding Hood, that portrays the wolf as a trickster and an evil monster. And the strange underlining moral to that story was that men are like wolves and will do anything necessary to get a young woman that he set his eyes on. Society has even gone so far as to label a certain whistle as a wolf whistle, and that is considered sexist and even banned in some areas. But these creatures aren't always bad. In fact, they've been known to save humans also, and like Kipling's The Jungle Book, where the Indian wolf, Raksha, adopted Mowgli, two young girls were saved by wolves in India. In October of 1920, a Christian missionary in India, Reverend Singh, heard reports from villagers of ghosts in the jungle near Gautamuri, India. Well, Reverend Singh and his wife ran an orphanage 70 miles away, so they enlisted the help of some locals to track down the ghosts, and they found a wolf's lair. At that lair, they dug it up to find two wolf cubs and then upon closer inspection of the lair they were two more cubs these two cubs were human children whom Reverend Singh named Amala who he estimated to be around eight years old and Kamala whom he estimated to be a little less than two in his diary he wrote after a few strokes of the spade and shovel opening up the wolves lair One of the wolves came out hurriedly and ran for its life into the jungle. The second one appeared quickly, frightened for his life. And a third appeared, howling, racing about restlessly, scratching the ground furiously, gnashing its teeth. I guessed from its whole bearing, it must have been the mother wolf. The men pierced her through with arrows and she fell dead. There had lived the wolf family, the two cubs, and the two other hideous beings were there in one corner, all four clutching together. It was really a task to separate them from one another. The ghosts were more ferocious than the cubs, making faces, showing teeth, and running back to huddle together. They were covered with a particular kind of sores, on the knee and the palm of the hand near the wrist which they had developed from walking on all fours. I found them very fond of raw meat and raw milk. They would run very fast just like squirrels and it was really a business to overtake them. And from the very beginning their aloofness was noticeable. They would crouch together in the corner of the room and sit there for hours on end facing the corner. We never kept them alone, but always purposely kept the few orphanage children in the room. They remained quite uninterested 
and indifferent. They wanted to be all by themselves. They shunned human society altogether. If we approached them, they made faces and sometimes showed their teeth, as if unwilling to permit our touch or company. The other children even tried their utmost to allure them to play with them. But this they resented very much and would frighten them by opening their jaws, showing their teeth, and at times making for them with a particular harsh noise. They could sit on the ground squatting down, but could not stand up at all. The girls could not walk like humans. They were on all fours. They used to sleep like pigs or dog pups, overlapping one another. They never slept after midnight and used to love to prowl the night fearlessly. The jaws also had gone through some sort of change in the chewing of bones and constant biting at the meat attached to the bone. When they moved their jaws in chewing, the upper and lower jaw bones appeared to part and close visibly, unlike human jaws. They could see better at night than by day. They could detect the existence of man, child, animal, or bird, or any other object in the darkest place when and where human sight fails completely. They had a powerful instinct and could smell meat or anything from a great distance. Kamala's instinct led her to locate the entrails of a fowl thrown outside the compound about 80 yards from the orphanage dormitory, where she was caught red-handed eating them. When any food was given them, they used to smell it before eating it. They used to eat their food and drink like dogs, lowering their mouths down to the plate. We were compelled to permit them to be naked all the while, except the loincloth stitched behind them in such a fashion that they could not open it. They resented this very much at first. They never shivered or showed any sign of feeling cold. Amala died of dysentery and tapeworms in September of 1921, less than a year after her capture. It is from this point that Reverend Singh and his wife concentrated solely on socializing Kamala. And he writes this in his diary to tell the extent of the success that he and his wife had. And in September of 21, Kamala reaches out her hand to take food. February of 1922, she kneels for the first time. May of 22, she stands holding a table. January 1923, she signals yes and no by moving her head. The summer of 1923, she stands by herself for the first time. Late fall of 1923, Kamala begins to show fear of the dark and finally the desire to sleep near other children. And in 1924, May, she uses a word to ask for rice. But it's not until January of 1926 that she walks and now knows 35 words. And in 1929, early January, she's learned 50 words but does not use the language spontaneously. But sadly, the end of 1929, November, at 17 years of age, roughly, Kamala dies. Now today, I'm not here to talk about the affectionate side of our wolf brothers, no. In fact, I'm here to discuss the exact opposite. We're going to be discussing the story of wolves at the Battle of Mon. Throughout history, the human race has had to fight Mother Nature and her beasts in order to scratch an existence out for ourselves. I know some of you are thinking that we should all live in harmony and we could walk side by side through this world, but the truth is that kind of world doesn't exist as great as that would be. No, because the type of world I'm talking about starts in the Margeride Mountains in South Central France between the years of 1764 and 1767. That's when the beast of Judavan 
made quite an impact on the residents of this area. These attacks covered a massive area stretching 90 kilometers by 80 kilometers, or roughly 56 miles by 50 miles. And they were believed to have been committed by a beast or beasts that had large teeth and immense tails, according to some eyewitnesses. Victims were often killed by having their throats torn out of their body. The Kingdom of France resorted to the use of large showing of manpower and money to hunt these animals. They hired soldiers, civilians, a number of royal huntsmen to do this bidding. And due to the age at which these attacks took place, there are conflicting stories as to how many lost their lives, but one study estimated that there have been 210 attacks, resulting in 113 deaths and 49 injuries. 98 of the victims killed were partially eaten. However, some other sources have claimed that it between 60 and 100 adults and children, as well as injuring more than 30. Now, the first of these recorded attacks took place in the early summer of 1764. There, a young woman was tending her cattle in a nearby forest close to Langone when she saw a monster charge out of the forest and straight for her. She later reported that the bulls in her herd saved her life by charging the beast down and keeping it at bay. And when it attacked a second time, the bulls charged again and drove it off. But 14-year-old Yambole had no bulls to rescue her. And shortly after the first attack, she was killed near the village of Lehubax. Over the later months in 1764, these attacks escalated and more and more and more were continually reported throughout the region. It didn't take long before the terror had gripped these people in this region. The scariest part, they report, was the fact that it didn't attack certain people, only lone individuals. If a woman was out tending her livestock while her husband was gone, or a child was tending the livestock, or even a single man singled out of the herd doing what he does is when the attacks would happen. It's also written down that it seemed to target only the victim's neck and head area. And by late 1764, a rumor began to circulate that there were a pair of monsters behind these killings. This was because there had been a high number of attacks in such a short space of time. It appeared that this monster was simply attacking for the fun of it. Now there's some contemporary accounts suggest that this beast or wolf or whatever it was had been seen with others such animals. That it was simply one and maybe local dogs had fell in with it. But then it began to attack multiple. A single beast attacked eight people on January 12th of 1765. Now this monster or monsters were eventually stopped and life as we know it picked back up and normalcy was what everyone in the area drifted back into. But like all good things, they come to an end. 150 years after the attacks in a small French village, a battle along the French borders would once again know the wrath of the wolf. The Battle of Mons started on August 23, 1914. This battle was between the A Company of the 4th Battalion, a City of London regiment, part of the 9th Brigade of 3rd Division, and the advancing German 1st. The Battle of Mons is considered the first major battle of World War I. When the German troops invaded Belgium on August 3rd, the British troops from the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, crossed to mainland Europe on August 14th. 
and the BEF was led by Sir John French. And by the time the BEF had gotten over to Belgium, they were a little behind their schedule. The French wanted a cautious approach until he and his force met up with the French 5th Army led by General Lanzarac. And the plan was for both forces to join up at Charolais. But on August 22nd, the BEF came across cavalry patrols from the German 1st and engaged them. General French made plans to attack the German force that he had assumed had to be in the region if they were sending out cavalry patrols. Now British intelligence warned him, said to be more cautious, because as the size of the German first was unknown in this area, and as a result of this intelligence, French ordered his men to dig in and build defensive positions near the Mons Canal. The commander of the German first army, a man named Cluck, was surprised by the proximity of the British forces. He and his army had just engaged Lanzarac in battle and was pursuing the French army south. Well, Cluck determined to take on the BEF and they first fought the British in the battle on August 23rd. French had deployed his men across a 40 kilometer front. The BEF was very outnumbered. They had roughly 70,000 men, 300 artillery guns. The Germans had around 600 artillery guns and 160,000 men. Now despite these numbers, the Germans did not do very well at the start of the battle. The BEF may have been referred to as a bunch of contemptibles by Kaiser Wilhelm II but they were nonetheless professional soldiers. The Germans believed that they were facing many British machine guns at Mons, but in fact, they were infantrymen firing Lee Enfield rifles. But at such a combined speed that the Germans got the impression of large machine guns. German intelligence had estimated that the BEF had 28 machine guns per battalion at Mons, whereas each battalion only had two and after the experiences of the BEF at the battle, Cluck, after the war had finished, described this. He described the BEF as an incomparable army. Well entrenched and completely hidden, the enemy opened a murderous fire. The casualties increased, the rushes became shorter, and finally the whole advance stopped. With bloody losses, the attack gradually came to an end. That was a German account of a British troop fire at Mons. And although the British fought well and inflicted huge casualties on the numerically superior Germans, they were eventually forced to retreat due both to the greater strength of the Germans and the sudden retreat of the French 5th Army. But in this space between the start and finish of this battle, it's there that we need to look at this. Imagine this. The British forces were heavily outnumbered and quickly sustained large casualties against the attacking German onslaught. The battle quickly devolved into the disgusting business of trench warfare. And as the brave and tough British forces dug in and continued with the fight, both sides refused to give an inch and both sides destroying the other with machine gun batteries, artillery fire, and constant rifle fire. And as a throwback to hand-to-hand -hand combat in the blood-soaked mud and walls of the trenches. Now between the trenches of the British and German sides was what is referred to as the no man's land. This turn was what they used to call the disputed area that lies between the trenches of the two enemy sides that both sides lay claim to, but neither can get to. No man's land areas during the war were typically heavily defended and fortified on both sides, of course, and any movement into them typically resulted in an onslaught of weapon fire and a rain of bullets. 
thus ensuring that these zones became barren wastelands where no one dared to walk. The only time anyone ventured into no man's land was during efforts to gain ground, of course, on the enemy when retreating or for the purpose of collecting wounded after the attack. From a book called War Horse, written by Michael Morprugo, he writes that I stood in a wide corridor of mud, a wasted, shattered landscape between two vast, unending rolls of barbed wire stretch away into the distance behind me and in front of me. I remembered I had been in such a place once before, that day when I had charged across it with Topthorn beside me. This was what the soldiers called no man's land. It was in this no man's land that the story of a monster began. It was reported that this beast would stalk the edges of the barbed wire and slaughter both British and German soldiers. This enormous hound soon became known as the Hound of Mons. The tale of this battlefield nightmare was originally brought to the public's attention in 1919 by a Canadian war veteran by the name of F.J. Newhouse. And after relating his gruesome tale from this battlefield, the story was originally published in a 1919 edition of the Ada Evening News from Ada, Oklahoma, but was soon picked up by other publications. According to Mr. Newhouse, the horror started when a Captain Yeskis and four other men of the London Fuselers pulled all their bravery together and entered the hell on earth known as No Man's Land in order to carry out a patrol that evening of the area. Captain Yeskis and his patrol never returned. Now, this was not seen as strange at the time because after all, they were in a combat zone and they had gone on patrol in the most dangerous part of that combat zone. No, the strangeness didn't start until the bodies of the five men were found several days later. It was then that the others noticed that something had ripped their throats out and left large teeth marks upon the corpses. A few nights later, it was reported that soldiers from both sides of No Man's Land heard an ear-piercing howl emanating from the darkness in the center of the battlefield. Its monstrous, blood-curdling sound was said to be so terrifying that some of the hardened soldiers who had fought that day believed it to be the devil himself come to join in the fight and considered retreating at once. During the coming days, more patrols would set out into the no man's land only to be found later in a similar mauled state, their throats having been ravaged and torn from their bodies by some huge beast. There were occasional cries of terror from German soldiers that seemed to indicate that they were suffering similar attacks also. The nighttime howls and roaring also increased in frequency. It was around this time that some of the soldiers that were on sentry duty along the edges of no man's land reported seeing what they said was an enormous gray hound slipping quietly through the shadows of the no man's land between the two enemies. And even after the British retreat, it was reported that this monster still hunted the area and that during the battles around Mons that more soldiers and even some civilians fell victim to this beast. It continued to be on the lips and minds of the soldiers until one day the attacks ceased. Suddenly, the monster named Hellhound was gone. But that's not where this story stops, and in truth, it gets even stranger. You see, Mr. Newhouse not just claimed that the Hound of Mons was very real, but that it had been the result of a German military experiment in efforts to make what they called biological weapons 
According to F.J., there was a German scientist named Dr. Gottlieb Hockmuller. Newhouse said that Dr. Hockmuller had undertaken an inhuman experiment with the sole purpose of inserting the brain of a maniac into a wolf. Newhouse said in an article from the August 1919 edition of the Oklahoman, the death of Dr. Gottlieb Hockmuller in the recent Spartacan riots in Berlin has brought to light facts concerning the fiendish application of this German scientist's skill that have astounded Europe. For the Hound of Mons was not an accident, a phantom, or hallucination. It was the deliberate result of one of the strangest and most repulsive scientific experiments the world has ever known. Mr. Newhouse alleges that Dr. Hockmuller personally searched mental health asylums from one end of Europe to the other, looking for a suitable subject who had gone insane from his hatred of England. Newhouse then claims that upon finding the perfect candidate, Dr. Hockmuller removed the patient's brain and surgically implanted it into the body of a large Siberian wolfhound. The giant gray monster with the mind of an English-hating madman was then trained and taken to the battlefield at Mons. And it was there this island of Dr. Moreau creature was released into no man's land and set about its violent work. It was also reported that the hound had been altered somehow to be larger than normal and that its capacity for hatred had been somehow enhanced chemically. Some say that its hide had even been made to be impervious to gunfire. Mr. Newhouse claimed that papers outlining the entire experiment had been found upon Dr. Hockmuller's death and that the doctor had wanted to build an army of these hounds to unleash upon the Allies. It was never reported if the doctor knew the beast would turn on his own men at the battle or if this were more than one of these creatures made by the good doctor. In addition to the strange tales of monster making like that of Frankenstein, much like that doctor, there seems to be no available records to show that Dr. Hockmuller even existed. Also equally strange, there's no record to show that there was ever a captain by the name of Yessex either. Maybe this is all simply the story of a man suffering from a vivid imagination and wanting to get his name in the paper for his 15 minutes of fame. Or maybe this is nothing more than a tale told to the German troops at the time to give them a sense of hope and that added advantage of knowing a snarling werewolf type creature is watching over them as they sleep. Nothing more than a morale booster. Or maybe it's a bit of disinformation spread by the Allies to cover up some elite group of Germans that were slaughtering their men and they wanted to take credit away from the German war machine. Maybe it was even a man in wolf skins, and this man, like the girls from India, had been raised by wolves, and now he was in service in the German military like a dog of war. Or maybe, just maybe, this story was true. There was a deranged man's brain surgically placed into an oversized wolfhound and released as a night sentry upon the enemies with great effectiveness. And just maybe, after the war, the documents of these experiments were found and destroyed, and the name of those involved wiped from history as to never show light on the true story of the Hellhound of Mons.
If you just enjoyed the last story, but feel like you need more, then you need to join Expanded Perspectives Elite. Expanded Perspectives Elite is an entirely separate show where Cam and me explore the same topics as we normally do every week on Expanded Perspectives, only in a more laid back and uncensored way. By joining Expanded Perspectives Elite, you will get an additional show every Thursday or Friday, as well as access to the entire back catalog, which consists of over 100 episodes for only $5 a month. Shows such as Robert the Doll, The Romanian Giant, The Marconi Deaths, and Bizarre Encounters During World War II, as well as studio collaborations and roundtables with some of your favorite authors like Micah Hanks, Nick Redfern, and Lyle Blackburn. To join Expanded Perspectives Elite, simply go to the website expandedperspectives.com and click on the Elite tab. Signing up is easy, and there are two plans to choose from, $5 a month or $55 a year. Expanded Perspectives Elite, the next step in expanding your perspective. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. A very interesting story. You know, the hound, the hellhound of, of Mons. Mons. And the possible scenario of, was it just like psychic warfare? They were just, this is just a story to psych the troops out? Or is this something that was really going on? Or was it really just a pack of wolves? Well, it's one of those things, I mean, what I like the most about it is you could, you could see it, it seems like it is open to all those things. I mean, we know the things that happen in, in combat, you know, and we've talked about even whenever they would use the Oswang vampire, right? And they would drain people and all that stuff. There's uh, when you start breaking down a, a person's morale, especially in in the combat situation, that's you're winning. I mean, you're winning. So I mean, if you've got to desecrate a corpse, if you've got to do some pretty rough stuff to in order to get that shock value across, how many other lives does it save? The dude's already dead. You cut their throat out. You make it look like something ravaged them. You know, you got an old boy with on your team that can howl like a wolf or you can, you know what I mean? You can start really messing with their minds. I could see how that could happen. I could also see how it would happen is there's a bunch of blood and guts and carnage and all that laying around a bunch of corpses that maybe they don't have uh, a way to really get rid of at the point. You know, they don't have time to bury them, whatever it is. And maybe the animals show up. Maybe it wasn't a big wolf. Maybe it was a big wolf hound. Maybe it was a big stray dog. I mean, who knows? Big German shepherd or something. Who knows? But then also, I love the idea of the fact if it was some crazy experiment. Right. I've never heard of that. Man, just the ideas of that whole thing just sound fun. I mean, that whole idea sounds awesome. Yeah, that's that's. It's crazy. Well, in our fascination with it, like I said, you start looking up just movies with the wolf in the title, not even werewolf, just wolf in the title. Tons of them. You start looking up, like we've always talked about, favorite werewolf movies of Howling and, you know, what is it, the American Werewolf in London, Underworld. I mean, you just start going through, I always think about, what is it, the one? Bad Moon. I like the movie Bad Bad Moon. Bad Moon. That was a cool one. I like the Wolfman. Whenever he goes crazy in the asylum, breaks out of the chair, starts killing all those dudes. Even go back to Silver Bullet. You know, you start thinking about those. But we're tossing all these around like that. All these crazy werewolf stories we're tossing around. It's still, it's our fascination. I find it odd, and I didn't really find it that odd until this episode, till I went to looking at all this, at not at the human, not just one specific group of a fascination, like one group of people are fascinated by this, or one, you know, maybe ethnicity is fascinated by this animal, like a Native American group may be fascinated, as the planet in a whole seems to have a fascination with wolves. I even think back to uh, the whole dire wolf idea. And then because they've found, you know, dire wolves and now they're using them like in Game of Thrones, you see them. There's always wolves. And it's one of two things. It's either, uh, you know, it shows the bravery. You know, it's the it's the fact yeah. that the clan, but also, too, that's the, the monstrous side. It's the fact that, you know, they're just like ruthless killers. And you it's just amazing to me. Like, I remember reading and I don't know. I don't have it pulled up in front of me. I wish I did. But I remember reading something where it showed a line of wolves and that they always put the oldest wolves at the front. 
because they let them dictate the speed. Because if you put the youngest in the front, they'll go off and leave the oldest. So the oldest wolves are in the very front because that they only go as fast as they can go. The youngers can always go that fast. And then the lone wolf is at the very back of the pack protecting the entire pack. And if you go on any kind of channel of YouTube or any of that and start looking at wolves hunting, it's very impressive. And then it, of course, my romantic, silly, historic mind, I like to picture the idea of like a hunter gatherer in his skins with his bow and all this and his arrows in an old quiver, you know, kind of looking like the Iceman. And then he's got a wolf or two with him that's like their pets and he feeds them and they help him and he helps them and they all work together. I like those ideas of that whole thing. But something about the howling sound, it's kind of like lion roars. You know, people are afraid of snakes, but only when they see them. Now, right. if, if a snake was roaring and made some kind of sound, you'd be afraid of it in the dark, too. Yeah. But you're only afraid, scared of it when you see it. Whereas in a wolf, I mean, you you can scare You're afraid of it by sight and by sound. Like in the movie The Gray with yeah. Liam Neeson, you know, they're howling, and, they're, and it shows how smart they are. I mean, it's there's some sort of connection that we have that I've never thought about until with them. Like I said, it's... It's in your DNA because your is. ancestors had to put up with wolves. Yes. This was a real thing. Wolves were everywhere at one time. They were just killed off. Yes. So I think that's what it is. It's, you're still, it's in your genetic makeup. I don't know that we'll ever shake it. And then I'll be talking about the folklore of hellhounds. You get into the, all the supernatural dogs in, in human history, too, is insane. Why did we put it on them? Why wasn't it like hell bats, you right, know, yeah. or like hell birds or a hell platypus or, a, right. you know, a hell possum? Oh, you got to look out for the hell possum. That didn't happen. That's a good point. It's hellhounds. What is it about our fascination with it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know. Pretty cool. But why don't you tell the folks about our new upcoming thing? Uh, We've decided yeah. to do something new. We've been talking about this for a while. We filmed the first one. It's going to be released very soon. Uh, folks, whenever you all get together and you send us the listener stories, we love it. We always love doing an episode and then getting listener story feedback like crazy, whether you message them on Facebook or email them and all that. So instead of doing podcasts over them and covering all that, what we started to do is break it down and kind of highlight each story instead of throwing it in a big pile and when i say that is we have started on our youtube channel we are going to start doing it looks like bi-weekly we're going to try to do it every two weeks at first we're going to see how it goes a new show called unusual encounters it is going to be video footage of us in studio discussing these topics discussing this story the whole thing so if you want to see what the inside of the studio looks like if you care what two hideous creatures behind these microphones look like <laughs> you're going to get to go to there and it's going to be on the same expanded perspectives youtube channel and about every couple of weeks we're going to release one and it's going to be called unusual encounters where we're going to come in we're going to talk we're going to talk about what's going on we're going to give the entire story and then we're going to discuss that story see what it ties into and all that so if you want to have a chance to hear your show on youtube your your story on youtube brother and also too Anytime you decide to email the show now with the story, please use the subject header, Unusual Encounters. That way we instantly know exactly what you're emailing for. So instead of going through all this and trying to dig them up when they pop up, we move them over so that we can kind of keep up with all of them because we kind of been getting hammered right. with them because it's too much for this. The The level of, of smarts that's in this room is very low, so we have to have all the help we can get. So, and that said, if you want to check it out, and you're not already subscribed, jump over to YouTube. It's free. So now not only are you going to have the Elite Show you can subscribe to and pay for, now you're going to get the show here every Monday. You're also going to a whole nother show. Like if you listen on YouTube already, you're good. You're good. You got it covered. But if you don't and you want to see more and you're already an Elite member and you're already listening on Mondays and you can't get enough, jump over to YouTube every few weeks. And we're also going to start doing something of where we're doing interviews in the house, in setting down with some of your favorite authors. We're going to sit down and do one-on-one -on -one video interviews with those people. So that's coming up here real shortly. It'll probably roll in this fall. Whenever right. We get that we got done. a lot of stuff going on. In addition to those things, we just got uh, welcomed into a group called Dark Myths, mm -hmm. which is a collective group of several other, other podcasts, ranging from history podcasts like History on Fire to other shows that do things similar to us, like Astonishing Legends, uh, Twilight Histories. To also uh, fictional podcast yes. and true crime podcast. So if you want to, you want to, if you like podcast, a big fan of it, and you'd like to know about some other shows, go over there and search darkmyths.org. And of course, I'll put links to it in the show notes, and you'll find some other really good podcasts that are over there. Um, Cam, what do you got planned for the week? Right now, I am working in my shop. I'm cleaning out my shop, I'm trying to rearrange it, trying to you know move tools around and put stuff up and all. It's kind of cluttered. 
Because of the, it's you know you start running out of time doing, it, and it was so hot this summer. I didn't want to get out there and mess with it. You know, I don't right. have any air conditioning in that shop. I mean, I don't for no way. But so now I'm trying to rearrange my little shop building and, and build some more shelves. So my wife can, of course, acquire more things. She likes to go to garage sales and buy crap like we don't have enough of our own crap. And then right. she likes to take other people's old crap and bring back and put it with our crap and then stack it all in one wall. That's what she likes to do. That's her hobby. Her hobby is acquiring crap from other people. <laughs> that's her hobby. So that's, I guess, now my hobby is building devices to hold that crap. I so, got you. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Well, at least it keeps you busy. busy you know, <laughs> yeah. it keeps you out of trouble, right? That's true. That's I just got a, true. I just got a regular work week. I think. I don't think there's any bumps in the road. I think it's just going to be. Hopefully, it's going to be a smooth, flowing week. Well, that's about all we have for this show, folks. If you're an elite member, we'll be speaking to you on Thursday. For everybody listening to this, please support the show by writing and rating the show on iTunes. Uh, that really helps us out. For pretty lights, dark myths, inner tradition books, new page books, Llewellyn books. An Ancient American Magazine. I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.